filmed and narrated by me, Rudy Rucker. It's based on software from Autodesk Incorporated. The software package is called James Glick's Chaos, the software. For more information on this product, please phone 1-800-882-8284. The price of James Glick's Chaos, the software, is $59.95. It runs on PCs and compatibles with EGA or VGA. For the next few simulations, we're going to be imagining a situation where we have some magnets and a pendulum hanging over the magnets. Depending on where we release the pendulum, whose end is shown as this white bob, we end up stuck to different magnets in the plane. This is an example of what chaos theorists call sensitive dependence on initial conditions. If I release the pendulum bob from a slightly different position, I end up in quite a different location. Our software allows you to change the sign of the magnets. Now the magnets are negative, and notice that the bob is being pushed away from them, although it's still attracted to the center. Again, think of it as a pendulum. This looks quite random, but notice we can reverse the direction of the bob, and it retraces its path. In other words, this seemingly chaotic process is being organized according to deterministic laws of n physics. Looking close up, the path looks completely scribbled, but again, if we were to reverse the path, the bob would retrace itself. By pressing another key, I can randomize the positions of the magnets, and if I use my small paddle, I can hit the bob and send it off into new paths. It still settles down into various sorts of basins of attraction, it's also interesting to put the magnets into a circle. So here, the magnets have a negative charge, they're repelling the bob, yet it's pulled towards the center. Sometimes it hammers against the magnets, other times it's find its way through. This again is a seemingly disorderly motion, a so-called chaotic motion, which is determined by the inverse square law of repulsion from the negative magnets and the linear force of attraction of the bob towards the screen center. Again, we might think of there as being a spring stretched from the screen center to the bob. Here we turn off the central attraction and look at two attracting magnets and, in effect, are looking at an example of what astronomers know as the three-body problem. Imagine a moon circling around two stationary planets and we observe that at irregular and unpredictable intervals, the moon is going to escape from one planet's orbit and fall over into the other planet's orbit. Now let's look at a situation where we imagine seven attracting magnets, and also we've made them sticky so that if the pendulum bob gets too close to them, it attaches to them. We imagine releasing the bob from successive points in the plane and coloring those points according to the color of the magnet which the bob sticks to. If I release it from the far left side of the screen, it's likely to land on the light blue magnet, so those spots are colored light blue. Next, it hits the green magnet, then the blue magnet, and so on. Now, An interesting thing to note is right between the light blue and the green attraction there's a region where it tends to fall through and go to a further away magnet. The singly colored regions are called basins of attraction. The light blue magnet is surrounded by a light blue basin of attraction. The green magnet is surrounded by a green basin of attraction. The dark blue magnet has a blue basin of attraction, and so on. The interesting thing is that the edges between the basins of attraction are very irregular. These boundaries are what is known as fractals and are infinitely complicated forms. 
A very famous example of a fractal is the Mandelbrot set, which was discovered by Benoit Mandelbrot in the of IBM. The Mandelbrot set is based on the simple equation z goes to z squared plus c. It's incredibly beautiful. Related to it are the Julia sets. For each point in the plane, there's a Julia set. The Mandelbrot set is the set of all points whose associated Julia set is disk-like or connected. If we zoom in on regions of the Mandelbrot set, we find copies of it. We find small pieces that looked just like the whole thing. It repeats itself, yet not in a regular fashion. Julia sets, on the other hand, such as this, repeat themselves in a predictable fashion. Each part of this Julia set is an exact replica of the whole thing. Returning to the Mandelbrot set, we're at the bud on the top of the set now, and I do several successive zooms, and again, these zooms are being done in real time. Our program paints the picture coarsely, then more finely, then yet more finely. Zooming in to a tendril, we find a tiny replica of the Mandelbrot set. And if we were to zoom further, we would find it exactly like the whole thing in every detail. By pressing a color spin button, we can produce a sort of false animation spinning the palette. Our program keeps a series of stamps on the left side of the screen to show where we've come from. This is a record of the zoom we just did. There's the top bud, a tendril coming out of it with a small Mandelbrot, a larger picture of that small Mandelbrot. Then we zoomed in on a small bud attached to the small Mandelbrot, and attached to that bud we found a tendril, and on the tendril we found this miniature Mandelbrot set. This is a very deep zoom at a location that is known as the 22-legged ant. I found the coordinates for this in Rollo Silver's, Silver's magazine, Amygdala, a newsletter about the Mandelbrot set. This is a way of filling in the interior of the Mandelbrot set. We call this the feather fill. One of the challenges in creating a new Mandelbrot set program was to make it different from the other ones. What we've done is to include the cubic Mandelbrot set, based on the map z goes to z cubed plus c. Actually, it's the map z goes to z cubed plus k z plus c. By varying k, we actually get a double infinity of cubic Mandelbrot sets. This is a cubic Mandelbrot set that's extremely distorted looking. Notice, however, that it does have symmetry about the origin. An interesting feature of these cubic Mandelbrot sets is that many of them have details that are in fact copies of the normal quadratic Mandelbrot set. If you look at the very top of this Mandel cubic Mandelbrot set and zoom in on it, you'll find a small copy of the regular quadratic Mandelbrot. There it is with its full richness of detail, and yet it's just a piece of this single cubic Mandelbrot, and there are a double infinity of cubic Mandelbrots to explore. This is one of the most exciting things that I found in helping to create this program. Here's another detail of a different cubic Mandelbrot set. Notice that we have an object like the bud typically found on the top of the quadratic Mandelbrot set, but the bud is sort of splitting open. To me, this looks like a laughing dragon. Another interesting feature to notice here is that the edge along the left side is so highly irregular. With a different coloring, we can keep looking at the edge and notice that it looks a bit like shrubbery on the top of a hillside. Here's another laughing Mandelbrot bud, again a section of a cubic Mandelbrot. Here's yet another split open bud. Here's a feather fill done on a detail of a cubic Mandelbrot. 
a surprising richness of organic forms is found. Again, note that all this is coming simply from repeating a cubic equation in the complex plane. Here's another version of the cubic Mandelbrot. Okay, let's move on and look at some strange attractors. This is the famous Lorentz attractor. And the Lorentz attractor is an object in three-dimensional space. So we're looking at several different three-dimensional views of it, a view along the x-axis, along the y-axis, and along the z-axis. We have points effectively flying around in this virtual three-dimensional space that we're looking at. Now, if we release a lot of points at one location, in fact, I think we have here 64 of them, and trace what happens to them as they move around on the Lorentz attractor, we'll find another example of sensitive dependence on initial conditions. These points all started out very close to each other, yet as they move on, they're going to become spread out all over the entire Lorentz attractor. Now at this point, we'll stop treating them like ribbons and start leaving uh, the old positions on so we can see a picture of the full Lorentz attractor building up. Notice, see the fanning out at the bottom there? That's an example of uh, splitting up that you get. Points that are nearby, as time goes by, no matter how near they were, they get spread out. Now, the reason that the points spread out is that what's at the middle of the Lorentz attractor is sort of like the center of a figure eight demolition derby track, except that it's always one way, the other way. That is to say, when you head into the intersection at the center of the Lorentz attractor, you always either have to go left or right. You can't keep going straight. Now, you also tend to wobble back and forth across the whole width of the Lorentz attractor. So if somebody's near you, you and he may end up on the opposite side of the midline, and you get split up onto the opposite ears. Here, if we zoom out from the Lorentz attractor, we can see that it really is an attractor. If I release test points from any position in 3D space, it gets pulled onto there, kind of like a fly being attracted to uh, some tasty garbage or some tasty fly swarm. And uh, the paths that they make are rather beautiful and sinuous. Once again, this is something that's defined by simple mathematical formulas. The next group of attractors I want to show you are, were discovered by York, and he calls these quasi-periodic maps. And What's happening here is we have a bunch of trig functions that are defining a new x and y position on the basis of an old x and y position. So effectively, the points are dancing around from position to position on the screen according to these formulas. They tend to accumulate at certain regions. Uh, this is what we would think of as the attractor, where the points tend to hit more often. And it builds up these wonderful dune-like patterns Though if we crank a certain parameter up, the dunes collapse into a single line. If we crank the parameter a bit higher, we'll find that the single line splits into loops. This is an attractor known as the Hainan attractor. Hainan is actually associated with a whole family of attractors, uh, many of which are more beautiful than this simple Hainan attractor. He found his attractors in considering the paths that stars travel in going around a galaxy. The idea is we have a, a torus-like galaxy, and we're cutting it in a cross-section and looking at the points where the stars tend to return to. I'm using my cursor to insert extra points into the attractor here and see where they go. Like the Mandelbrot set, the Hainan attractor is a fractal. That is to say, if I were to zoom in on it, I would be able to find details similar to the whole thing. By changing one of the parameters of the Hainan attractor, I can actually see a whole family of different related Hainan attractors. We find uh, something that was sort of like a circle is mutating into something that's a little bit more like a square, and later it becomes something a bit more like a triangle. These are gotten by adjusting a single parameter. The equations defining the Hainan attractor are fairly simple. It's two equations defining new x and y position in terms of old x and y position. And the certain parameter that we might call the chaoticity parameter is involved in the two equations.
In order to watch where the points are going, we can turn on the trace and show, draw a line from position to position. So if I go down to just one point, I find it's moving around a triangle that's turning and getting bigger and smaller. If I have two points, I see two triangles, three points, three triangles. If I turn the trace back off for a moment, I can get a picture of where the points are landing. So this is, when the figure's finished, it looks static, yet it's really the process of an ongoing dynamic process. This example, again, shows chaos in the sense of a mixture of order and complexity. We have the orderly formula, we have the complicated motions of the points, but yet we also have a kind of orderly and simple pattern which they're going on to. Predicting the actual path of any one point can be rather difficult. This next example shows the logistic map, which is really a stack of one-dimensional strange attractors. Moving from left to right, we see a series of single-point attractors, then a series of two-point attractors, then a series of four-point attractors, and so on. We think of the attractors arranged vertically. Here's an oscillation between four different values, and this picture shows the way the four-point attraction is really being computed. There's a certain map, the quadratic map, nu x equals r times x times 1 minus x. For a certain value of r, any starting x will dance between four different values. This corresponds to a certain section of the entire logistic map. If we take a different section, we'll find a place where the point oscillates between six different values. No matter what the starting value is, it'll be attracted to dancing among these six values, uh, slightly fuzzy. And if we look at how it's computed, looking at the parabola picture, we see one, two, three, four, five, six different vertical values, or six different horizontal values, depending how you want to look at it. The logistic map itself is a fractal, so if I zoom in on a piece of it, I'm going to find things that look like the whole thing. Our program in its initial zooms shows uh, the preliminary steps of computing the strange attractor, and these themselves lead to rather interesting and uh, wiggly curves. So we see here's a branching that again branches and rebranches. I'm zooming in a little bit closer, and uh, I'll find sort of an endless cascade of bifurcations. The logistic map is spoken of as an example of the period doubling root to chaos. As you move to the right in it, you find regions where the number of values being hit becomes effectively infinite. This is an example of an iterated function system, also known as Barnsley fractals, because they've been studied so extensively by Michael Barnsley. The way a Barnsley fractal is created is that one defines some number of maps in the plane and imagines a point which alternates between obeying one map or the other map or the third map. The fern is created actually by four maps. The most important map is the large one. I've drawn it as a square with an eye and a mouth so we can perceive its orientation. The uh, smaller maps below are somewhat lighter, the way they're drawn, because they're applied less often. The fourth map is a little hard to make out. It's simply a stick at the bottom of the picture. Now suppose that I start moving the large map around. I notice that I get completely different fern shapes. The Barnsley fractal is a chaotic process that's very sensitive to the plane maps that we use to define it. With sufficient care, one can produce an extremely wide variety of shapes using the Barnsley method. This is a fractal known as the Sierpinski gasket. It's named after the set theorist Vakla Sierpinski. Here we imagine three maps, each of them shrinking the screen by half, one moving the screen to the upper left, the other to the upper right, and the third to the bottom. If I take that upper right map and move it around, notice I get a series of different Sierpinski gaskets.
Again, what's going on here is that I throw a point or a flock of points onto the screen, and each point keeps rolling a three-sided die, if you will, in order to decide which map to obey. I can visualize the map a little differently by starting different groups of points. We can also change the map by resizing it. In other words, the maps don't all have to correspond to equal sizes, and we can get extremely wide variety. Now the map has a mirror image flip as well as a shrink. Now we've made it longer. Now we move it back towards the left of the screen. And next we'll try rotating it a little. This Barnsley module is again part of James Glick's Chaos, the software available from Autodesk. This is an example of a natural looking form created using Barnsley fractals. Barnsley feels that in the future we may be able to store nice looking images simply by storing the Barnsley maps. This is a dragon-like fractal. You'll notice the coloring in these Barnsley fractals varies. Uh, there's actually nine different coloring schemes that we have in our program. Now we look at the maps. The maps are essentially each of them is an upside down square, one of them facing left, one of them facing right. If we move one of the guys around, we essentially can drag him by his eye, we get uh, variations on the fractal. Each of them really exquisitely beautiful. Again, we see the unifying theme in chaos is that we have something mathematically simple, in this case two maps in the plane, but by repeating, doing a lot of computation, we get extremely rich and complicated patterns. The application to physics is the concept that nature is defined perhaps by very simple laws, but nature is also in a sense a computation which is running for a very long time and in a lot of places. It's a parallel computation, really, and it's been running for billions of years. The universe has an extremely large budget. Here's a Barnsley fractal that looks like a tree. I got the coordinates of this from an article in Scientific American by uh, Heinz Otto Peitgen and two of his colleagues. I was typed these coordinates in, and I had the same picture that I saw in the magazine. Here's a Barnsley fractal based on three maps. It's a spiral. Here's a Barnsley fractal that shows uh, sort of a snowflake type curve based on six maps. Here we take quite a few maps and we can actually force the attractor to end up spelling out chaos simply by having a map the shape of each of the component pieces of the letters of chaos. Each little piece, of course, is made up of further copies of the word chaos. I call this Barnsley fractal surf. This is called pincher. This shows a different aspect of Barnsley fractals. We have four maps here, and by clicking the mouse at different positions, we can make the dancing point more likely to obey one map or the other map. The maps don't have to have equal weight. In other words, we're rolling a four-sided die, but we're putting different weights on the different sides of the dice. This is a different one. This one is based on two maps. This is called the twig. This is based, I believe, on five maps, and it creates a somewhat naturalistic pattern resembling the grain of wood. These are some needle-like triangles, and this is fireworks to end the show. Our chaos program includes six modules. This is from the module known as Forge for fractal forgery. By adjusting certain fractal dimensions, we can create a random fractal which can resemble either clouds or mountains or the surface of a planet. Going to the control panel, you can adjust the fractality 
the height above sea level that we want the thing to have, and the power factor, which controls the steepness of the mesa sides. And you get some sort of control over a fractal forgery of a landscape that you want to create. So here's a nicer looking planet than we had before. Now the sixth module of our chaos program is a cellular automaton module. So the six modules are magnets, strange attractors, Mandelbrot sets, Barnsley fractals, fractal forgeries, and cellular automata. Cellular automata tie in with chaos because, again, we have extremely simple definition of a cellular automaton. A cellular automaton is a parallel type of computation. We imagine each cell on the screen as looking at the colors of its neighboring cells. Now I've randomized the screen, so essentially we're starting with nothing, and something that's interesting is that we're going to have order emerging out of complete randomness. This again is kind of typical of the things that chaos can do. You can start with complete disorder by applying the simple equation over and over. You can get this global implicit order coming out of the formulas and leading to somewhat orderly patterns. The orderly pattern that we're looking here for is a double scrolled spiral known as a Jabotinsky spiral. These spirals were first observed in chemical experiments by the Soviet chemist Jabotinsky. This computation is, once again, parallel, meaning that each cell looks at its neighbors, sums up the values of the neighbors, computes a new value, and the same rule is being applied everywhere. This is a slightly different Jabotinsky reaction produced using cellular automata. And this is going to be the last image that I'm going to show you in this film. Again, for more information about ordering James Glick's Chaos to the software, you can call toll-free 1-800-882-8284 This has been Chaos, filmed and narrated by Rudy Rucker. Copyright 1990 in the name of Rudy Rucker. Software by Autodesk Incorporated. Thanks for watching.